Babbitt by Sinclair Lewis. Chapter 16 The certainty that he was not going to be accepted by the McKevleys made Babbitt feel guilty and a little absurd. But he went more regularly to the Elks, and a Chamber of Commerce luncheon he was oratorical regarding the wickedness of strikes, and again he saw himself as a prominent citizen. His clubs and associations were food comfortable to his spirit. Of a decent man in Zenith it was required that he should belong to one, preferably two or three, of the innumerous lodges and prosperity-boosting lunch clubs, to the Rotarians, the Kiwanians, or the Boosters, to the Odd Fellows, Moose, Masons, Red Men, Woodmen, Owls, Eagles, Maccabees, Knights of Pythias, Knights of Columbus, and other secret orders characterized by a high degree of hardiness, sound morals, and reverence for the Constitution. There were four reasons for joining these orders. It was the thing to do. It was good for business, since Lodge Brothers frequently became customers. It gave to Americans unable to become Jahim Rate or Commodore, such eucocious honorifics as High Worthy Recording Scribe and Grand Hugao, to add to the commonplace distinctions of Colonel, Judge, and Professor. And it permitted the swaddled American husband to stay away from home for one evening a week. The lodge was his pizzeria or pavement café. He could shoot pool and talk man-talk, be obscene and valiant. Babbitt was what he called a joiner, for all these reasons. Behind the gold and scarlet banner of his public achievements was the dun background of office routine, leases, sales contracts, lists of properties to rent. The evenings of oratory and committees and lodges stimulated him like brandy, but every morning he was sandy-tongued. Week by week he accumulated nervousness. He was in open disagreement with his outside salesman, Stanley Graff, and once, though her charms had always kept him nickerly polite to her, he snarled at Miss McGunn for changing his letters. But in the presence of Paul Reisling he relaxed. At least once a week they fled from maturity. On Saturday they played golf during, "'As a golfer, you're a fine tennis player.' or they motored all Sunday afternoon, stopping at village lunchrooms to sit on high stools at a counter and drink coffee from thick cups. Sometimes Paul came over in the evening with his violin, and even Zilla was silent as the lonely man who had lost his way and forever crept down unfamiliar roads, spun out his dark soul in music. 2. Nothing gave Babbitt more purification and publicity than his labors for the Sunday school. His church, the Chatham Road Presbyterian, was one of the largest and richest, one of the most oaken and velvety in Zenith. The pastor was the Reverend John Jonathan Drew, M.A., D.D., L.L.D. The M.A. and the D.D. were from Elbert University, Nebraska, and the L.L.D. from Waterbury College, Oklahoma. He was eloquent, efficient, and versatile. He presided at meetings for the denunciation of unions or the elevation of domestic service, and confided to the audience that, as a poor boy, he had carried newspapers. For the Sunday edition of The Evening Advocate, he wrote editorials on the manly man's religion and the dollars and cents value of Christianity, which were printed in bold type, surrounded by a regular border. He often said that he was proud to be known as primarily a businessman, and that he certainly was not going to permit old Satan to monopolize all the pep and punch. He was a thin, rustic-faced young man, with gold spectacles and a bang of dull brown hair. But when he hurled himself into oratory, he glowed with power. He admitted that he was too much the scholar and poet to imitate the evangelist Mike Mundy, and he had once awakened his fold to new life and to larger collections by the challenge, My brethren, the real cheapskate is the man who won't lend to the Lord. He had made his church a true community center. It contained everything but a bar. It had a nursery, a Thursday evening supper with a short, bright missionary lecture afterwards, a gymnasium, a fortnightly motion picture show, a library of technical books for young workmen, though, unfortunately, no young workman ever entered the church except to wash the windows or repair the furnace, and a sewing circle, which made short little pants for the children of the poor, while Mrs. Drew read aloud from earnest novels. 
Though Dr. Drew's theology was Presbyterian, his church building was gracefully Episcopalian. As he said, it had the most permeable features of those noble ecclesiastical monuments of grand old England, which stand as symbols of the eternity of faith, religious and civil. It was built of cheery iron-spot brick in an improved Gothic style, and the main auditorium had indirect lighting from electric globes in lavish alabaster bowls. On a December morning when the Babbitts went to church, Dr. John Jonathan Drew was unusually eloquent. The crowd was immense. Ten brisk young ushers in morning coats with white roses were bringing folding chairs up from the basement. There was an impressive musical program conducted by Sheldon Smith, educational director of the Y.M.C.A., who also sang the offertory. Babbitt cared less for this, because some misguided person had taught young Mr. Smith to smile, 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 while he was singing. But with all the appreciation of a fellow orator, he admired Dr. Drew's sermon. It had the intellectual quality which distinguished the Chathan Road congregation from the grubby chapels on Smith Street. At this abundant harvest time of all the year, Dr. Drew chanted, when, though stormy the sky and laborious the path to the drudging wayfarer, yet the hovering and bodiless spirit swoops back o'er all the labors and desires of the past twelve months, oh, then it seems to me there sounds behind all our apparent failures the golden chorus of greeting from those passed happily on, and lo, on the dim horizon, we see behind dolorous clouds the mighty mass of mountains, mountains of melody, mountains of mirth, mountains of might. I certainly do like a sermon with culture and thought in it, meditated Babbitt. At the end of the service he was delighted when the pastor, actively shaking hands at the door, twittered, Oh, Brother Babbitt, can you wait a jiffy? Want your advice? Sure, doctor, you bet. Drop into my office. I think you'll like the cigars there. Babbitt did like the cigars. He also liked the office, which was distinguished from other offices only by the spirited change of the familiar wall placard to This is the Lord's Busy Day. Chum Frank came in, then William W. Ethorne. Mr. Ethorne was the seventy-one-year-old president of the First State Bank of Zenith. He still wore the delicate patches of side-whiskers, which had been the uniform of bankers in 1870. If Babbitt was envious of the smart set of the McEvleys before William Washington Ethorne, he was reverent. Mr. Ethorne had nothing to do with the smart set. He was above it. He was the great-grandson of one of the five men who founded Zenith in 1792. And he was of the third generation of bankers. He could examine credits, make loans, promote or injure a man's business. In his presence, Babbitt breathed quickly and felt young. The Reverend Dr. Drew bounced into the room and flowered into speech. I have asked you gentlemen to stay so I can put on a proposition before you. The Sunday school needs bucking up. It's the fourth largest in Zenith, but there's no reason why we should take anybody's dust. We ought to be first. I want to request you, if you will, to form a committee of advice and publicity for the Sunday School. Look it over and make any suggestions for its betterment, and then, perhaps, see that the press gives us some attention. Give the public some really helpful and constructive news instead of all these murders and divorces. Excellent, said the banker. Babbitt and Frank were enchanted to join him. 3. If you had asked Babbitt what his religion was, he would have answered in Sonora's Boosters Club rhetoric, My religion is to serve my fellow man, to honor my brother as myself, and to do my bit to make life happier for one and all. If you had pressed him for more detail, he would have announced, I'm a member of the Presbyterian Church, and naturally I accept its doctrines. If you had been so brutal as to go on, he would have protested, uh, there's no use discussing and arguing about religion. It just stirs up bad feeling. Actually, the content of his theology was that there was a supreme being who had tried to make us perfect, but presumably had failed, that if one was a good man, he would go to a place called heaven. Babbitt, 
unconsciously pictured it as a rather like an excellent hotel with a private garden. But if one was a bad man, that is, if he murdered or committed burglary, or used cocaine or had a mistress, or sold non-existent real estate, he would be punished. Babbitt was uncertain, however, about what he called this business of hell. He explained to Ted, "'Of course, I'm pretty liberal. I don't exactly believe in fire and brimstone hell. Stands to reason, though, that a fellow can't get away with all sorts of vice and not get nicked for it. See what I mean?' Upon this theology he rarely pondered. The kernel of his practical religion was that it was respectable and beneficial to one's business, to be seen going to services, that the church kept the worst elements from being still worse, and that the pastor's sermons, however dull, they might seem at the time of taking, yet had a voodooistic power which did a fellow good, kept him in touch with higher things. His first investigations for the Sunday School Advisory Committee did not inspire him. He liked the busy folks' Bible class composed of mature men and women and addressed by the old school physician Dr. T. Atkins Jordan, in a sparkling style comparable with that of the more refined, humorous after-dinner speakers. But when he went down to the junior classes, he was disconcerted. He heard Sheldon Smeet, educational director of the YMCA and leader of the church choir, a pale and but strenuous young man with curly hair and a smile, teaching a class of sixteen-year-old boys. Smeeth lovingly admonished him. "'Now, fellows, I'm going to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk, everything at my house next Thursday. We'll get off by ourselves and be frank about what our secret worries. You can just tell old Sheldy anything, like all the fellows do at the Y. I'm going to explain frankly about the horrible practices a kitty falls into unless he's guided by a big brother, and about the perils and glory of sex. Old Sheldy beamed damply. The boys looked amused, and Babbitt didn't know which way to turn his embarrassed eyes. Less annoying, but also much duller, were the minor classes which were being instructed in philosophy and oriental ethnology by Ernest Spinsters. Most of them met in the highly varnished Sunday school room, but there was an overflow to the basement, which was decorated with varicose water pipes and lighted by small windows high up in the oozing wall. What Babbitt saw, however, was the first Congregational Church of Catawaba. He was back in the Sunday school of his boyhood. He smelled again that polite stuffiness to be found only in church parlors. He recalled the case of drab Sunday school books. Petty, a humble heroine, and Josephus, a lad of Palestine. He thumbed once more the high-colored text cards, which no boy wanted, but no boy could throw away, because they were somehow sacred. He was tortured by the stumbling rote of thirty-five years ago, as in the vast scene of the church he listened to. Now, Edgar, you read that next verse. What does it mean? When it says it's easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye. What does it teach us? Clarence, please don't wiggle so. If you had studied your lesson, you wouldn't be so fidgety. Now, Earl, what is the lesson Jesus was trying to teach his disciples? The one thing I want you to especially remember, boys, is the words. With God, all things are possible. Just think of that always. Clarence, please pay attention. Just say, with God, all things are possible. Whenever you feel discouraged, and Alec, Will you read the next verse? If you'd pay attention, you wouldn't lose your place. Drone, 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 gigantic bees that boomed in a casern of drowsiness. Babbitt started from his open-eyed nap, thanked the teacher for the privilege of listening to her splendid teaching, and staggered on to the next circle. After two weeks of this, he had no suggestion whatsoever for the Reverend Dr. Drew, then he discovered the world of Sunday school journals, an enormous and busy domain of weeklies and monthlies, which were as technical and practical as forward-looking as the real estate columns or the shoe trade magazines. He bought half a dozen of them at a religious bookshop, and till after midnight he read them and admired. He found many lucrative tips on focusing appeals scouting for new members, and getting prospects to sign up with the Sunday school. He particularly liked the word prospects, and he was moved by the rubric. 
the moral springs of the community's life lie deep in its sunday schools its schools of religious instruction and inspiration neglect now means loss of spiritual vigor and moral power in years to come facts like the above followed by a straight-arm appeal will reach folks who can never be laughed or jollied into doing their part babbitt admitted that's so i used to skin out of the old sunday school at catawab every chance i got but at the same time i wouldn't be where i am today maybe if it hadn't been for its training in a moral power and all about the bible great literature have to read some of it again one of these days how scientifically the sunday school could be organized he learned from an article in the westminster adult bible class the second vice president looks after the fellowship of the class she chooses a group to help her these become ushers everyone who comes gets a glad hand no one goes away a stranger one member of the group stands on the doorstep and invites passers-by to come in perhaps most of all babbitt appreciated the remarks by william h ridgway in the sunday school times if you have a sunday school class without any pep and get up and go in it that is without interest that is uncertain in attendance that acts like a fellow with the spring fever let old dr ridgway write you a prescription rx invite the bunch for supper the sunday school journals were as well rounded as they were practical they neglected none of the arts as to music the sunday school times advertised that c harold loudon known to thousands through his sacred compositions had written a new masterpiece entitled yearning for you the poem by harry d kerr is one of the daintiest you could imagine and the music is indescribably beautiful critics are agreed that it will sweep the country may be made into a charming sacred song by substituting the hymn words i heard the voice of jesus say even manual training was adequately considered babbitt noted an ingenious way of illustrating the resurrection of jesus christ model for pupils to make a tomb with rolling door use a square covered box turned upside down pull the cover forward a little to form a groove at the bottom cut a square door also cut a circle of cardboard to more than cover the door cover the circular door and the tomb thickly with stiff mixture of sand flour and water and let it dry it was the heavy circular stone over the door the woman found rolled away on easter morning this is the story we are to go tell in their advertisements the sunday school journals were thoroughly efficient babbitt was interested in a preparation which takes the place of exercise for sedentary men by building up depleted nerve tissue nourishing the brain and the digestive system he was edified to learn that the selling of bibles was a hustling and strictly competitive industry and as an expert on hygiene he was pleased by the sanitary communion outfit company's announcement of an improved and satisfactory outfit throughout including highly polished beautiful mahogany tray this tray eliminates all noise is lighter and more easily handled than others and is more in keeping with the furniture of the church than a tray of any other material Four. He dropped the pile of Sunday school journals. He pondered. Now there's a real he world, corking. Shamed I haven't sat in more. Fellow that's an influence in the community, shame if he doesn't take part in a real virile hustling religion. Sort of Christianity Incorporated, you might say. But with all reverence. Some folks might claim these Sunday school fans are undignified and unspiritual and so on. Sure always some skunk to spring things like that knocking and sneering and tearing down so much easier than building up but me i certainly hand it to these magazines they've brought old george f babbitt into camp and that's the answer to the critics the more manly and practical a fellow is the more he ought to lead the enterprising christian life me for it cut out this carelessness and boozing and roan where the devil you been there's a fine time of night to be coming in. Babbitt by Sinclair Lewis Chapter 17 1. There are but three or four old houses in Floral Heights. 
and in Floral Heights an old house is one which was built before 1880. The largest of these is the residence of William Washington Ethorne, president of the First State Bank. The Ethorne Mansion preserves the memory of the nice parts of Zenith, as they appeared from 1860 to 1900. It is a red brick immensity with gray sandstone lintels, and a roof of slate in courses of red, green, and diseptic yellow. There are two anemic towers, one roofed with copper, the other crowned with cast-iron ferns. The porch is like an open tomb. It is supported by squat granite pillars, above which hang frozen cascades of brick. At one side of the house is a huge stained-glass window in the shape of a keyhole. But the house has an effect not at all humorous. It embodies the heavy dignity of those Victorian financiers who ruled the generation between the pioneers and the brisk sales engineers, and created a somber oligarchy by gaining control of banks, mills, land, railroads, mines. Out of the dozen contradictory zeniths, which together make up the true and complete zenith, none is so powerful and enduring, yet none so unfamiliar to the citizens as the small, still dry, polite, cruel zenith of the William Easthorns, and for that tiny hierarchy the other zeniths unwittingly labor and insignificantly die. Most of the castles of the testy Victorian terrarchs are gone now or decayed into boarding houses, but the Eathorn mansion remains, virtuous and aloof, reminiscent of London, Black Bay, Brighton House Square, its marble steps are scrubbed daily, the brass plate is reverently polished, and the lace curtains are as prim and as superior as William Washington Ethorne himself. With a certain awe, Babbitt and Chum Frink called on Ethorne for a meeting of the Sunday School Advisory Committee. With uneasy stillness, they followed a uniform maid through the catacombs of reception rooms to the library. It was as unmistakably the library of a solid old banker as Ethorne's side whiskers were the side whiskers of a solid old banker. The books were, most of them, standard sets, with the correct and traditional touch of dim blue, dim gold, and glossy calfskin. The fire was exactly correct and traditional, a small, quiet, steady fire, reflected by polished fire irons. The oak desk was dark and old and altogether perfect. The chairs were gently supercilious. Ethorne's inquiries as to the health of Mrs. Babbitt, Miss Babbitt, and the other children were softly parental, but Babbitt had nothing with which to answer him. It was indecent to think of using the house tricks, old socks, which gratified Virgil Gunch and Frank and Howard Littlefield men who till now had seemed successful and urbane. Babbitt and Frink sat politely, and politely did Ethorne observe, opening his thin lips just wide enough to dismiss the words. Gentlemen, before we begin our conference, you may have felt the cold in coming in here, so good of you to save an old man the journey. Shall we perhaps have a whiskey toddy? So well trained was Babbitt in all the conversation that it fits a good fellow, that he almost disgraced himself with, uh, rather than make trouble and always providing there ain't any enforcement officers hiding in the wastebasket. The words died choking in his throat. He bowed and flustered obedience. So did Chum Frink. Ethorne rang for the maid. The modern and luxurious Babbitt had never seen any one ring for a servant in a private house, except during meals. Himself in hotels had rung for bellboys, but in the house you didn't hurt Matilda's feelings. You went out in the hall and shouted for her, nor had he, since Prohibition, known anyone to be casual about drinking. It was extraordinary merely to sip his toddy and not cry, Oh, Mama, this hits me right where I live. And always with the ecstasy of youth meeting greatness, he marveled. A little fuzzy face there, why, he could make me or break me if he told my banker to call my loan. Gosh, 
that quarter-sized squirt, and looking like he hadn't got a single bit of hustle in him. I wonder, do we boosters throw too many fits about pep? From this thought he shuddered away and listened devoutly to Ethorne's idea on the advancement of the Sunday school, which were very clear and very bad. Diffidently, Babbitt outlined his own suggestions. I think if you analyze the needs of the school, in fact, going right at it is as if it were a merchandising problem. The course of the one basic and fundamental need is growth. I presume we're all agreed we won't be satisfied till we build up the biggest darn Sunday school in the whole state. So the Chatham Road Presbyterian won't have to take anything off anybody. Now about jazzing up the campaign for prospects. They've already used contesting teams and given prizes to the kids that bring in the most members. And they made a mistake there. The prizes were a lot of folder rolls and doodads like poetry books and illustrated testaments instead of something a real live kid would want to work for, like real cash or a speedometer for his motorcycle. Of course, I suppose it's all fine and dandy to illustrate the lessons with those decorated bookmarks and blackboard drawings and so on, but when it comes down to the real he-hustling, getting out and drumming up customers, or members, I mean, why, you got to make it worth a fellow's while. Now I want to propose two stunts. First, Divide the Sunday school into four armies, depending on age. Everybody gets a military rank in his own army according to how many members he brings in. And the duffers that lie down on us don't bring in any. They remain privates. The pastor and superintendent rank as generals. And everybody has got to give salutes and all the rest of that junk, just like a regular army, to make them feel it's worthwhile to get rank. Then, second... Of course, the school has its advertising committee, but, Lord, nobody ever really works good. Nobody works well just for the love of it. The thing to do is be practical and up-to-date, and hire a real paid press agent for the Sunday school, some newspaper fellow who can give part of his time. Sure, you bet, said Chum Frank. Think of the nice juicy bits he could get in, Babbitt crowed. Not only the big, salient, vital facts about how fast the Sunday school and the collection is growing, but a lot of humorous gossip and kidding. How about some blowhard fell down on his pledge to get new members, or the good time the Sacred Trinity girls had at their Winehurst party? And on the side, if he had time, the press agent might even boost the lessons themselves. Do a little advertising for all the Sunday schools in town. In fact, no use being hoggish towards the rest of them, providing we can keep the bulge on them in membership. For instance, he might get the papers to, of course, I haven't got a literary training like Frank here, and I'm just guessing how the pieces ought to be written, but take, for instance, suppose the week's lesson is about Jacob. Well, the press agent might get in something that would have a fine moral, and yet with a trick headline that'd get folks to read it. Say, like, Jake fools the old man, makes get away with girl and bankroll. So, I mean, that'd get to your interest. Now, of course, Mr. Eathorne, you're conservative, and maybe you feel these stunts would be undignified, but honestly, I believe they'd bring home the bacon. Eathorne folded his hands on his comfortable little belly and purred like an aged pussy. I say that I have been very much pleased by your analysis of the situation, Mr. Babbitt. As you surmise, it's necessary in my position to be conservative and perhaps endeavor to maintain a certain standard of dignity. Yet I think you'll find me somewhat progressive in our bank, for example. I hope I may say that we have as modern a method of publicity and advertising as any in the city. Yes, I fancy you'll find our soulsters quite cognizant of the shifting spiritual values of the age. Yes, oh, yes. And so, in fact, it pleases me to be able to say that, though personally I might prefer the sterner Presbyterian of an earlier era, Babbitt finally gathered that Ethorne was willing. 
Chum Frink suggested as part-time press agent one Kenneth Escott, reporter for the Advocate Times. They parted on a high plane of amity and Christian helpfulness. Babbitt did not drive home, but toward the center of the city he wished to be by himself and exult over the beauty of intimacy with William Washington Eathorne. Two. A snow-blanched evening of ringing pavements and eager lights. Great golden lights of trolley cars sliding along the packed snow of the roadway. Demure lights of little houses. A bleaching glare of a distant foundry, wiping out the sharp-edged stars. Lights of neighborhood drugstores where friends gossiped, well pleased, after the day's work. The green light of a police station and greener radiance on the snow. The drama of a patrol wagon, gong beating like a terrified heart, headlights scorching the crystal sparkling street, driver, not a chauffeur, but a policeman, proud in uniform, another policeman, perilously dangling on the step at the back in a glimpse of the prisoner, a murderer, a burglar, a coiner, cleverly trapped. An enormous gray stone church with a rigid spire, dim light in the parlors and cheerful throng of choir practice, the quivering green mercury vapor light of a photo-engraver's loft, then the storming lights of downtown, parked cars with ruby taillights, white arched entrances to movie theaters like frosty mouths of winter caves, electric signs, serpents, and little dancing men of fire, pink shaded globes, and scarlet jazz music in a cheap upstairs dance hall, lights of Chinese restaurants, Lanterns painted with cherry blossoms and with pagodas, hung against lattices of lustrous gold and black, small dirty lamps and small stinking lunchrooms, the smart shopping district, with rich and quiet light on crystal pendants and furs and suave surfaces of polished wood in velvet-hung reticent windows. High above the street, an unexpected square hanging in the darkness, the window of an office where someone was working late for reason unknown and stimulating, a man meshed in bankruptcy, an ambitious boy, an oil man suddenly become rich. The air was shrewd, the snow was deep in uncleared alleys, and beyond the city Babbitt knew were hillsides of snowdrift among wintry oaks and the curving ice-encrusted river. He loved his city with passionate wonder. He lost the accumulated weariness of business, worry, and expansive oratory. He felt young and potential. He was ambitious. It was not enough to be a Virgil Gunch, an Orville Jones, no. They're bully fellows, simply lovely, but they haven't got any finesse. No, he was going to be an Ethorn, delicately rigorous, coldly powerful. That's the stuff the wallop and the velvet mitt. Not let anybody get fresh with you. Been getting careless about my diction, slang, colloquial. Cut it out. I was first-rate at rhetoric in college. Thames on, anyway, not bad. Had too much of this hoop doodle and good fellow stuff. Why couldn't I organize a bank of my own some day? And Ted succeed me. He drove happily home, and to Mrs. Babbitt was a William Washington Eathorne but she did not notice it. 3. Young Kenneth Escott, reporter on the Advocate Times, was appointed press agent of the Chatham Road Presbyterian Sunday School. He gave six hours a week to it. At least he was paid for giving six hours a week. He had friends on the press and gazette, and he was not officially known as a press agent. He procured a trickle of insinuating items about neighborliness and the Bible about class suppers, jolly but educational, and the value of their prayer life in attaining financial success. The Sunday school adopted Babbitt's system of military ranks. Quickened by this spiritual refreshment, it had a boom. It did not become the largest school in Zenith. The Central Methodist Church kept ahead of it by methods which Dr. Drew scored as unfair, undignified, un-American, ungentlemanly, and unchristian. But it climbed from fourth place to second, and there was rejoicing in heaven, or at least in that portion of heaven included in the parsonage of Dr. Drew, while Babbitt had much praise and good repute. He had received the rank of colonel on the general staff of the school, 
he was plumply pleased by salutes on the street from unknown small boys his ears were tickled to ruddy ecstasy by hearing himself called colonel and if he did not attend sunday school merely to be thus exalted certainly thought about it all the way there he was particularly pleasant to the press agent kenneth escott he took him to lunch at the athletic club and had him to the house for dinner like many of the cocksure young men who forge about cities in apparent contentment and who express their cynicism in supercilious slang escott was shy and lonely his shrewd starveling face broadened with joy at dinner and he blurted gee willikers miss babbitt if you knew how good it is to have home eats again escott and verona liked each other all evening they talked about ideas they discovered that they were radicals true they were sensible about it they agreed that all communists were criminals that this verse libre was tommy rot and that while there ought to be universal disarmament of course great britain and the united states must on behalf of oppressed small nations keep a navy equal in the tonnage of all the rest of the world but they were so revolutionary that they predicted to babbitt's irritation that there would some day be a third party which would give trouble to the republicans and democrats Escott shook hands with babbitt three times at parting babbitt maintained his extreme fondness for earthorn within a week three newspapers presented accounts of babbitt's sterling labors for religion and all of them tactfully mentioned william washington earthorn as his collaborator nothing had brought babbitt quite so much credit at the elks the athletic club and the boosters his friends had always congratulated him on his oratory but in their praise was doubt for even in speeches advertising the city there was something highbrow and degenerate like writing poetry but now orville jones shouted across the athletic dining-room here's the new director of the first state bank grover butterbaugh the eminent wholesaler of plumber supplies chuckled wonder you mix with common folks after holding a thorn's hand and emil wengret the jeweler was at last willing to discuss buying a house in dorchester four when the sunday school campaign was finished babbitt suggested to kenneth escott say how about doing a little boosting for doc drew personally escott grinned you trust the doc to do a little boosting for himself mr babbitt there's hardly a week goes by without his ringing up the paper to say if we'll chase a reporter up to his study he'll let us in on the story about the swell sermon he's going to preach on the wickedness of short skirts or the authorship of the pentarosh don't you worry about him there's just one better publicity grabber in town and that's this dora gibson tucker that runs the child welfare and the americanization league and the only reason she's got drew beaten is because she has got some brains well now kenneth i don't think you ought to talk that way about the doctor preacher has to watch his interest hadn't he you remember that in the bible about about being diligent in the lord's business or something all right i'll get something in it for you if you want me to mr babbitt but i'll have to wait till the managing editor is out of town and then blackjack the city editor thus it came to pass that in the sunday advocate times under a picture of dr drew at his earnestness with eyes alert jaws granite an rustic lock flamboyant appeared in an inscription a wood pulp tablet conferring twenty-four hours in mortality the rev dr john jennison drew m a pastor of the beautiful catham road presbyterian church in lovely floral heights is a wizard soul winner he holds the local record for conversions during his shepherdhood an average of almost a hundred sin-weary persons per year have declared the resolve to lead a new life and have found a harbor of refuge and peace everything zips at the catham road church the subsidiary organizations are keyed to the top notch of efficiency dr grew is especially keen on good congregational singing bright cheerful hymns are used at every meeting and the special sing services attract lovers of music and professionals from all parts of the city on the popular lecture platform as well as in the pulpit dr drew is a renowned word painter and during the course of the year he received literally scores of invitations to speak at varied functions both here and elsewhere 
five. Babbitt let Dr. Drew know that he was responsible for this tribute. Dr. Drew called him brother and shook his hand a great many times. During the meetings of the advisory committee, Babbitt had hinted that he would be charmed to invite Ethorne to dinner, but Ethorne had murmured, So nice of you, old man, now. Almost never go out. Surely Ethorne would not refuse his own pastor, Babbitt said boyishly to Drew. Say, hey, doctor, now we've put this thing over, strikes me it's up to the dominie to blow the three of us for a dinner. Bully, you bet, delighted, cried Dr. Drew in his manifest way. Someone had once told him that he talked like the late President Roosevelt. And, uh, say, doctor, be sure to get Mr. Ethorne to come. Insist on it. It's, uh, I think he sticks around home too much for his own health. Ethorne came. It was a friendly dinner. Babbitt spoke gracefully of the stabilizing and educational value of bankers to the community. They were, he said, the pastors of the fold of commerce. For the first time, Ethorne departed from the topic of Sunday schools and asked Babbitt about the progress of his business. Babbitt answered modestly, almost filially. A few months later, when he had a chance to take part in the Street Traction Company's terminal deal, Babbitt did not care to go to his own bank for a loan. It was rather a quiet sort of deal, and if it had come out, the public might not have understood. He went to his friend Mr. Eathorne. He was welcomed and received the loan as a private venture, and they both profited in their pleasant new association. After that, Babbitt went to church regularly, except in spring Sunday mornings, which were obviously meant for motoring. He announced to Ted, I tell you, boy, there's no stronger bulwark of sound conservatism than the evangelical church, and no better place to make friends who'll help you gain your rightful place in the community than in your own church home. End of chapter 17 Babbitt by Sinclair Lewis Chapter 18 1 Though he saw them twice daily, though he knew and amply discussed every detail of their expenditures, yet for weeks together Babbitt was no more conscious of his children than of the buttons on his coat sleeves. The admiration of Kenneth Escott made him aware of Verona. She had become secretary to Mr. Gruensberg of the Gruensberg Leather Company. She did her work with the thoroughness of a mind which reveres details and never quite understands them. But she was one of the people who gave an agitating impression of being on the point of doing something desperate, of leaving a job or a husband, without ever doing it. Babbitt was so hopeful about Escott's hesitant adores that he became the playful parent. When he returned from the Elks, he peered coyly into the living room and gurgled, "'Has your Kenny been here tonight?' He never credited Verona's protest. Why, Ken and I are just good friends, and we only talk about ideas. I don't have all this sentimental nonsense that would spoil everything. It was Ted who most worried Babbitt. With conditions in Latin and English, but with a triumphant record in manual training, basketball, and organization of dances, Ted was struggling through his senior year in the East Side High School. At home he was interested only when he was asked to trace some subtle ill in the ignition system of the car. He repeated to his tut-tutting father that he did not wish to go to college or law school, and Babbitt was equally disturbed by his shiftlessness and by Ted's relations with Eunice Littlefield next door. Though she was the daughter of Howard Littlefield, that wrought-iron fact mill, that horse-faced priest of private ownership. Eunice was a midge in the sun. She danced into the house. She flung herself into Babbitt's lap when he was reading. She crumpled his paper and laughed at him when he adequately explained that he hated a crumpled newspaper as he hated a broken sales contract. She was seventeen now. Her ambition was to be a cinema actress. She did not merely attend the showing of every feature film. She also read the motion picture magazines, those extraordinary symptoms of the age of pep monthlies and weeklies, gorgeously illustrated with portraits of young women, 
who had recently been manicure girls, not very skillful manicure girls, and who, unless their every grimace had been arranged by a director, could not have acted in the Easter cantana of the Central Methodist Church. Magazines reporting quite seriously in interviews plastered with pictures and riding breeches and California bungalows, the views on sculpture and international politics of blankly beautiful, suspiciously beautiful young men, outlined the plots of films about pure prostitutes and kind-hearted train robbers, and giving directions for making bootblacks into celebrated scenario authors overnight. These authorities Eunice studied. She could, she frequently did, tell whether it was in November or December, 1905, that Mac Harker, the renowned screen cowpuncher and bad man, began his public career as the chorus man in Oh, You Naughty Girlie. On the wall of her room, her father reported, she had pinned up twenty-one photographs of actors, but the signed portrait of the most graceful of the movie heroes she carried in her young bosom. Babbitt was bewildered by this worship of the new gods, and he suspected that Eunice smoked cigarettes. He smelled the cloying reek from upstairs, and heard her giggling with Ted. He never inquired. The agreeable child dismayed him. Her thin and charming face was sharpened by bobbed hair, her skirts were short, her stockings were rolled, and as she flew after Ted, above the caressing silk were glimpses of soft knees which made Babbitt uneasy, and wretched that she should consider him old. Sometimes, in the veiled life of his dreams, when the fairy child came running to him, she took on the semblance of Eunice Littlefield. Ted was motor-mad as Eunice was movie-mad. A thousand sarcastic refusals did not check his teasing for a car of his own. However lax he might be about early rising in the prosody of Virgil, he was tireless in tinkering. With three other boys he bought a rheumatic Ford chassis, built an amazing racer body out of tin and pine, went skidding around corners in the perilous craft, and sold it at a profit. Babbitt gave him a motorcycle, and every Saturday afternoon, with seven sandwiches and a bottle of Coca-Cola in his pockets, and Eunice perched eerily on the rumble seat, he went roaring off to distant towns. Usually Eunice and he were merely neighborhood chums and quarreled with a wholesome and violent lack of delicacy. But now and then, after the color and scent of a dance, they were silent together and a little furative. Babbitt was worried. Babbitt was an average father. He was affectionate, bullying, opinionated, ignorant, and rather wistful. Like most parents, he enjoyed the game of waiting till the victim was clearly wrong, then virtuously pouncing. He justified himself by croaking, "'Well, Ted's mother spoils him. Got to be somebody who tells him what's what and me. I'm elected the goat, because I try to bring him up a real decent human being, and not with those sapheads and lounge lizards. Of course, they all call me a grouch. Throughout, with the eternal human genius, or arriving by the worst possible routes at surprisingly tolerable goals, Babbitt loved his son and warmed to his companionship, and would have sacrificed everything for him, if he could have been sure of proper credit. Two. Ted was planning a party for his set in the senior class. Babbitt meant to be helpful and jolly about it, from his memory of high school pleasures back in Catawaba. He suggested the nicest games, going to Boston and charades with stewpans for helmets, and word games in which you were an adjective or a quality. When he was most enthusiastic, he discovered that they weren't paying attention. They were only tolerating him. As for the party, it was as fixed and standardized as the Union Club hop. There was to be dancing in the living room, a noble coalition in the dining room, and in the hall two tables of bridge for what Ted called the poor old dumbbells that you can't get to dance hardly more than half the time. Every breakfast was monopolized by conferences on the affair. No one listened to Babbitt's bulletins about the February weather or to his throat-clearing comments on the headlines. He said furiously, if I may be permitted to interrupt your engrossing private conversation, 
Did you hear what I said? Oh, don't be a spoiled baby. Ted and I have just as much right to talk as you have, flared Mrs. Babbitt. On the night of the party, he was permitted to look on, when he was not helping Matilda with the Vichia ice cream and the Petit Fours. He was deeply disquieted eight years ago when Verona had given a high school party. The children had been fearless gabbies. Now they were men and women of the world, very supercilious men and women. The boys condescended to Babbitt. They wore evening clothes, and with hot hair, they accepted cigarettes from silver cases. Babbitt had heard stories of what the Atlantic Club called goings-on at young parties, of girls parking their corsets in the dressing-room, of cuddling and petting, and with a presumable increase in what was known as immorality. Tonight he believed the stories. These children seemed bold to him and cold. The girls wore misty chiffon, coral velvet, or cloth of gold, and around their dipping bobbed hair were shining wreaths. He had it, upon urgent and secret inquiry, that no courses were known to be parked upstairs, but certainly these eager bodies were not stiff with steel. Their stockings were of lustrous silk, their slippers costly and unnatural, their lips carmine, and their eyebrows penciled. They danced cheek to cheek with the boys, and Babbitt, sickened with apprehension and unconscious envy. Worst of them all was Eunice Littlefield, and maddest of all of the boys was Ted. Eunice was a flying demon. She slid the length of the room. Her tender shoulders swayed. Her feet were deft as a weaver's shuttle. She laughed and enticed Babbitt to dance with her. Then he discovered the annex to the party. The boys and girls disappeared occasionally, and he remembered rumors of their drinking together from hip-pocket flasks. He tiptoed around the house, and in each of a dozen cars waiting in the street he saw the points of light from cigarettes, from each of them hearing high giggles. He wanted to denounce them, but standing in the snow, peering around the dark corner, he did not dare. He tried to be tactful. When he returned to the front hall, he coaxed the boys, Say, uh, if any of you fellows are thirsty, there's some dandy ginger ale. No, oh, thanks, they condescended. He sought his wife in the pantry and exploded. I'd like to go out there and throw some of those young pups out of the house. They talk down to me like I was the butler. I'd like to. I know, she sighed. Only everybody says all the mothers tell me, unless you stand for them. If you get angry because they go out on their cars and have a drink, they won't come to your house any more, and we wouldn't want Ted left out of things, would we? He announced that he would be enchanted to have Ted left out of things, and hurried back in to be polite, lest Ted be left out of things. But he resolved if he found that the boys were drinking, he would. Well, he'd hand them something that would surprise them. While he was trying to be agreeable to large-shouldered young bullies, he was earnestly sniffing at them. Twice he caught the reek of prohibition-time whiskey, but then it was only twice. Dr. Howard Littlefield lumbered in. He had come in a mood of solemn parental patronage to look on. Ted and Eunice were dancing, moving together like one body. Littlefield gasped. He called Eunice. There was a whispered dialogue, and Littlefield explained to Babbitt that Eunice's mother had a headache and needed her. She went off in tears. Babbitt looked after them furiously. That old devil! Getting Ted into trouble and Littlefield, a conceited old gasbag, acting like it was Ted that was the bad influence. Later he smelled whiskey on Ted's breath. After the civil farewell to the guests, the row was terrific. A thorough family scene like an avalanche, devastating and without reticences. Babbitt thundered, Mrs. Babbitt wept, Teb was unconvincingly defiant, and Verona in confusion as to whose side she was taking. For several months there was coolness between the Babbitts and the Littlefields, each family sheltering their lamb from the wolf-cub next door. Babbitt and Littlefield still spoke in pontifical periods about motors and the Senate, but they kept bleakly away from mention of their families. 
Whenever Eunice came to the house, she discussed with pleasant intimacy the fact that she had been forbidden to come to the house, and Babbitt tried, with no success whatever, to be fatherly and advisory to her. 3. Gosh, all fish hooks, Ted wailed to Eunice as they wolfed hot chocolate, lumps of nugent, and an assortment of glazed nuts in the mosaic splendor of the royal drug store. It gets me why Dad doesn't just pass out from being so pokey. Every evening he sits there, about half asleep, and if Roan or I say, Oh, come on, let's do something, he doesn't even take the trouble to think about it. He just yawns and says, No, nah, this suits me right here. He doesn't know there's any fun going in anywhere. I suppose he must be thinking same as you and I do, but gosh, there's no way of telling it. I don't believe that outside the office and playing a little bum golf on Saturday, he knows there's anything in the world to do except just keep sitting there and sitting there every night, not wanting to go anywhere, not wanting to do anything, thinking us kids are crazy, sitting there, Lord. Or. If he was frightened by Ted's slackness, Babbitt was not sufficiently frightened by Verona. She was too safe. She lived too much in the neat little airless room of her mind. Kenneth Escott and she were always underfoot. When they were not at home, conducting their cautiously radical courtship over sheets of statistics, they were trudging off to lectures by authors and Hindu philosophers and Swedish lieutenants. Gosh! Babbitt wailed to his wife as they walked home from the Fogarty's bridge party. It gets me how Roe and that fellow can be so pokey. They sit there night after night, whenever he isn't working, and they don't know if there's any fun in the world, all talk and discussion. Lord, sitting there, sitting there, night after night, not wanting to do anything, thinking I'm crazy because I like to go out and play a fist of cards, sitting there, gosh. Then around the swimmer bored by struggling through the perpetual surf of family life, newcomers swelled. Five. Babbitt's father and mother-in-law, Mr. and Mrs. Henry T. Thompson, rented their old house in the Bellevue district and moved into the Hotel Hatton, that glorified boarding house filled with widows, red plush furniture, and the sound of ice-water pitchers. They were lonely there, and every Sunday evening the Babbitts had to dine with them, on fricasseed chicken, discouraged celery, and cornstarch ice cream, and afterwards sit polite and restrained in the hotel lounge, while a young woman violinist played songs from the German via Broadway. Then Babbitt's own mother came down from Catawaba to spend three weeks. She was a kind woman, and magnificently uncomprehending. She congratulated the convention defying Verona as being a nice, loyal homebody without all these ideas that so many girls seem to have nowadays. And when Ted filled the differential with grease, out of pure love of mechanics and filthiness, she rejoiced that he was so handy around the house, and helping his father and all, and not going out with the girls all the time and trying to pretend to be a society fellow. Babbitt loved his mother, and sometimes he rather liked her. But he was annoyed by her Christian patience, and he was reduced to pulpiness when she discoursed about a quite mythical hero called Your Father. You won't remember it, Georgie. You were such a little fellow at the time. I, I remember just how you looked that day with your goldy-brown curls and your lace collar, you always were such a tainty child, and kind of a puny and sickly, and you loved pretty things so much, and the red tassels of your little booties and all, and your father was taking us to church, and a man stopped us and said, Major? So many of the neighbors used to call your father Major. Of course, he was only a private in the war, but everybody knew that he was because of the jealousy of his captain, and he ought to have been a high-ranking officer. He had the natural ability to command that so very few men have. And this man came out into the road and held up his hand and stopped the buggy and said, Major, he said, there's a lot of folks around here that have decided to support 
Colonel Scannell for Congress, and we want you to join us, meeting people the way you do in the store. You could help us a lot. While your father just looked at him and said, I certainly shall do nothing of the sort. I don't like his politics, he said. Well, the man, Captain Smith, they used to call him, and heaven only knows why, because he had the shadow of vestige of a right to be called Captain, or any other title. This Captain Smith said, We'll make it hot for you if you don't stick by your friends, Major. Well, you know how your father was, and this Smith knew it, too. He knew what a real man he was, and he knew your father knew the political situation from A to Z, and he ought to have seen that here was one man he couldn't impose on. But he went on trying and hinting and trying till your father spoke up and said to him, Captain Smith, he said, I have a reputation around these parts for being one who is amply qualified to mind his own business and let other folks mind theirs. And with that he drove on and left the fellow standing there in the road like a bump on a log. Babbitt was most exasperated when she revealed his boyhood to the children. He had, it seemed, been fond of barley sugar, had worn the loveliest little pink bow in his curls, and corrupted his own name to Goo Goo. He heard, though he did not officially hear, Ted admonishing Tinga. Come on now, kid. Stick the lovely pink bow in your curls and beat it down to breakfast, or Goo Goo will jaw your head off. Babbitt's half-brother Martin and his wife and youngest baby came down from Catawaba for two days. Martin bred cattle, and they ran the dusty general store. He was proud of being a free-born, independent American of the good old Yankee stock. He was proud of being honest, blunt, ugly, and disagreeable. His favorite remark was, how much you pay for that? He regarded Verona's books, Babbitt's silver pencil, and flowers on the table as citified extravagances, and said so. Babbitt would have quarreled with him, but for his gawky wife and the baby whom Babbitt teased and poked fingers at, and addressed. I think this baby's a bum, yes, sir. I think this little baby's a bum. He's a bum, yes, sir. He's a bum. That's what he is. He's a bum. This baby's a bum. He's nothing but a bum. That's what he is, a bum. All the while, Verona and Kenneth Escott held long inquiries into espionage. Ted was a disgraced rebel, and Tinka, aged eleven, was demanded that she be allowed to go to the movies thrice a week, like all the girls. Babbitt raged. I'm sick of it. Have to carry three generations. Whole damn bunch lean on me. Pay half of mother's income. Listen to Henry T. Listen to Myra's worrying. Be polite to Matt and get called an old grouch for trying to help the children, all of them depending on me and picking on me, and not a damn one of them grateful. No relief, no credit, and no help from anybody, and to keep it up for good Lord knows how long. He enjoyed being sick in February. He was delighted by their consternation that he, the rock, should give way. He had eaten a questionable clam. For two days he was languorous and petted and esteemed. He was allowed to snarl, Hurry me along, without reprisals. He lay on the sleeping porch and watched the winter sun slide along the taut curtains, turning the rusty khaki to pale blood red. The shadow of the draw rope was dense, black, in an enticing ripple on the canvas. He found pleasure in the curve of it, sighed as the fading light blurred it. He was conscious of life and a little sad with no Virgil glinches before whom to set his face in resolute optimism or beheld, and half admitted that he beheld his way of life as incredibly mechanical, mechanical business, a brisk selling of badly built houses, mechanical religion, a dry, hard church shut off from the real life of the streets, inhumanly respectable as a top hat mechanical golf and dinner parties and bridge and conversation. Save with Paul Riesling, mechanical friendships. Back-slapping and jocular, never daring to essay the test of quietness. He turned uneasily in bed. He saw the years 
the brilliant winter days and all the long sweet afternoons, which were meant for summery meadows, lost in such brittle pretentiousness. He thought of telephoning about leases, of cajoling men he hated, of making business calls and waiting in dirty anterooms, hat on knee, yawning at fly-specked calendars, being polite to office boys. I don't hardly want to go back to work, he prayed. I'd like to. I don't know. But he was back the next day, busy and of doubtful temper. End of chapter 18 Babbitt by Sinclair Lewis Chapter 19 1. The Zenith Street Traction Company planned to build car repair shops in the suburb of Dorchester. But when they came to buy the land, they found it held, on options, by the Babbitt Thompson Realty Company. The purchasing agent, the first vice president, and even the president of the traction company protested against the Babbitt price. They mentioned their duty towards stockholders. They threatened an appeal to the courts, though somehow the appeal to the courts was never carried out and the officials found it wiser to compromise with Babbitt. Carbon copies of the correspondence are in the company's files where they may be viewed by any public commission. Just after this, Babbitt deposited $3,000 in the bank. The purchasing agent of the traction company bought a $5,000 car. He, first vice president, built a home in Devon Woods, and president was appointed minister to a foreign country. To obtain the options to tie up one man's land without letting his neighbor know, had been an unusual strain on Babbitt. It was necessary to introduce rumors about planning garages and stores, to pretend that he wasn't taking any more options, to wait and look as bored as a poker player at a time when the failure to secure a key lot threatened the whole plan. To all this was added a nerve-jabbing quarrel with his secret associates in the deal. They did not wish Babbitt and Thompson to have any share in the deal except as brokers. Babbitt rather agreed. Ethics of the business broker ought to strictly represent his principles and not get in on the buying, he said to Thompson. Ethics rats. Think I'm going to see that bunch of holy grafters get away with a swag and us not climb in, snorted old Henry. Well, I don't like to do it. Kind of double-crossing. It ain't. It's triple-crossing. It's the public that gets double-crossed. Well, now we've been ethical and got it out of our systems. The question is, where can we raise a loan to handle some of the property for ourselves, on the QT? We can't go to our bank for it. Might come out. I can see old Ethorn. He's close as the tomb. That's the stuff. Ethorn was glad, he said, to invest in character to make Babbitt the loan and see to it that the loan did not appear on the books of the bank. Thus certain of the options which Babbitt and Thompson obtained were on parcels of real estate which they themselves owned, though the property did not appear in their names. In the midst of closing this splendid deal, which stimulated business and public confidence by giving an example of increased real estate activity, Babbitt was overwhelmed to find that he had a dishonest person working for him. The dishonest one was Stanley Graff, the outside salesman. For some time Babbitt had been worried about Graff, he did not keep his word to tenants. In order to rent a house, he would promise repairs which the owner had not authorized. It was suspected that he juggled inventories of furnished houses, so that when the tenant left he had to pay for articles which had never been in the house, and the price of which Graff put in his pocket. Babbitt had not been able to prove these suspicions, and though he had rather planned to discharge Graff, he had never quite found time for it. Now into Babbitt's private room charged a red-faced man, panting, "'Look here! I've come to raise particularly merry hell, and unless you have the fellow pinched, I will. What? what calm down, old man. What's trouble?' "'Trouble, huh? Here's trouble. Sit down and take it easy. They can hear you all over the building. This fellow Graff you got working for you? He leases me a house. I was in it yesterday and signs the lease. Oh, okay. And he was to get the owner's signature and mail the lease last night. Well, and he did. This morning I comes down to breakfast, and a girl says a fellow had come to the house right after the early delivery and told her he wanted an envelope that had been mailed by mistake. Big, long envelope, with Babbitt Thompson in the corner. But sure enough, there it was. So she lets him have it. 
and she describes the fellow to me, and it was this graph. So I phones to him, and he, the poor fool, he admits it. He says after my lease was all signed, he got a better offer from another fellow, and he wanted my lease back. Now what you going to do about it? Your name is? William Varney, W.K. Varney. Oh, yes, that was the garrison house. Babbitt sounded the buzzer. When Miss McGowan came in, he demanded, Graff gone out? Yes, sir. We look through his desk and see if there is a lease made out to Mr. Varney on the garrison house. To Varney, can't tell you how sorry I am this happened. Needless to say, I'll fire Graff the minute he comes in. And, of course, their lease stands. But there's one other thing I'd like to do. I'll tell the owner not to pay us the commission, but apply it to your rent. No, straight. I want to. To be frank, this thing shakes me up bad. I suppose I've always been a practical businessman. Probably I've told one or two fairy stories in my time, when the occasion called for it. But, you know, sometimes you have to lay things on thick to impress boneheads. But this is the first time that I've ever had to accuse one of my own employees of anything more dishonest than pinching a few stamps. Honest. It would hurt me if we profited by it. So. You'll let me hand you the commission? Good. Two. He walked through the February city, where trucks flung up a spattering of slush, and the sky was dark above dark brick cornices. He came back miserable. He, who respected the law, had broken it by concealing the federal crime of interception of the mail. But he could not see Graff go to jail, his wife suffer. Worse, he had to discharge Graff, and this was a part of office routine which he feared. He liked people so much. He so much wanted them to like him that he could not bear insulting them. Miss McGowan dashed into whisper with the excitement of an approaching scene. He's here. Mr. Graff, ask him to come in. He tried to make himself heavy and calm in his chair and to keep his eyes expressionless. Graff stalked in, a man of thirty-five, dapper, glass-eyed, with a foppish mustache. Want me, said Graff. Yes, yeah, sit down. Graff continued to stand grunting. I suppose that old mutt Varney has been in to see you. Let me explain about him. He's a regular tightwad, and he sticks out for every cent, and he practically lied about his ability to pay rent. I found that out just after we signed up, and then another fellow comes along with a better offer on for the house, and I felt it was my duty to the firm to get rid of Varney and I was so worried about it I scun up there and got back the lease. Honest, Mr. Babbitt, I didn't intend to pull anything crooked. I was just wanted the firm to have all the commish. Wait now, Stan. This may all be true, but I've been having a lot of complaints about you. Now, I don't suppose you ever mean to do wrong, and I think if you just get a good lesson, that'll jog you up a little. You'll turn out a first-class realtor yet but I don't see how I can keep you on. Graff leaned against the filing cabinet, his hands in his pocket, and laughed. So I'm fired. Well, oh, vision and ethics. I'm tickled to death, but I don't want you to think you can get away with any holier-than-thou stuff. Sure, I've pulled some raw stuff, a little of it. But how could I help it in this office? Now, by God, young man, tut-tut, keep the naughty temper down, and don't holler, because— Everybody in the outside office will hear you. They're probably listening right now, Babbitt, old dear. You're crooked in the first place and a damn skinflint in the second. If you paid me a decent salary, I wouldn't have to steal pennies off a blind man to keep my wife from starving. Us married just five months and her the nicest girl living, and you keeping us flat broke all the time, you damned old thief, so you can put money away for your saphead of a son and your wishy-washy fool of a daughter. Wait now. You'll by God take it, or I'll bellow so the whole office will hear it. And crooked. Say, if I told the prosecuting attorney what I know about this last street traction option steal, both you and me would go to jail along with some nice, clean, pious, high-up traction guns. Well, Stan, looks like we're coming down to cases. That deal? There was nothing crooked about it. The only way you can get progress is for the broad-gauged men to get things done and they got to be rewarded. Oh, for Pete's sake, don't get virtuous with me. As I gather it, I'm fired. All right. It's a good thing for me, and if I catch you knocking me to any other firm, I'll squeal 
all i know about you and henry t and the dirty little lip spittle deals that you corporals of industry pull off the bigger and brainier crooks and you'll get chased out of town and me you're right babbitt i've been going crooked but now i'm going straight and the first step will be to get a job in some office where the boss doesn't talk about ideals bad luck old dear and you can stick the job up the sewer babbitt sat for a long time alternately raging i'll have him arrested and yearning i wonder no i've never done anything that wasn't necessary to keep the wheels of progress moving next day he hired in graff's place fritz wellinger the salesman of his most injurious rival the east side homes and development company and thus at once annoyed his competitor and quired an excellent man young fritz was a curly-headed merry tennis-playing youngster he made customers welcome to the office babbitt thought of him as a son and in him had much comfort three an abandoned rice track on the outskirts of chicago a plot excellent for factory sites was to be sold and jake offutt asked babbitt to bid on it for him the strain of the street traction deal and his disappointment in stanley graff had so shaken babbitt that he found it hard to sit at his desk and concentrate he proposed to his family oh look here folks do you know who's going to trot up to chicago for a couple of days just a weekend won't lose but one day of school know who's going with the celebrated business ambassador george f babbitt why mr theodore roosevelt babbitt hooray ted shouted oh maybe the babbitt men won't paint that old town red and once away from the familiar implications of home they were two men together ted was young only in his assumption of oldness and the only realms apparently in which babbitt had a larger and more grown-up knowledge than ted's were the details of real estate and the phrases of politics when the other sages of the pullman smoking compartment had left them to themselves babbitt's voice did not drop into the playful and otherwise offensive tone in which one addresses children but continued its overwhelming and monotonous rumble and ted tried to imitate it in his strident tenor gee dad you certainly did show that poor boot when he got flip about the league of nations well trouble with a lot of fellows is they simply don't know what they're talking about they don't get down to facts what do you think of ken escott i'll tell you dad it strikes me ken is a nice lad no special faults except he smokes too much but slow lord why if we don't give him a shove the poor dumbbell never will propose and roan is just as bad slow yes guess you're right they're slow they haven't either one of em got our pep that's right they're slow i swear dad i don't know how roan got into our family i'll bet if the truth were known you were a bad old egg when you were a kid well it wasn't slow but you weren't i'll bet you didn't miss many tricks well when i was out with the girls i didn't spend all the time telling them about the strike in the knitting industry they roared together and together lighted cigars what are we going to do with them babbitt consulted gosh i, I don't know i swear sometimes i feel like taking ken aside and putting him over the jumps and saying to him young fellow me lad are you going to marry young roan or are you going to talk her to death here you are getting on toward thirty and you're only making twenty or twenty-five dollars a week when you going to develop a sense of responsibility and get a raise if there's anything that george f or i can do to help you call on us but show a little speed anyway well at that it might not be so bad if you or i talk to him except he might not understand he's one of those highbrows he can't come down to cases and lay his cards on the table and talk straight out from the shoulder like you and i can that's right he's like all those highbrows that's so like all of em that's fact they sighed and were silent and thoughtful and happy the conductor came in he had once called babbitt's office to ask about houses hurry mr babbitt we are going to have you with us to chicago this are your boy yes this is my son ted well now what do you know about that here i've been thinking you were a youngster yourself not a day over forty hardly and you with this great big fellow forty why brother i'll never see forty-five again 
Is that a fact? Wouldn't hardly have thought it. Yes, sir, it's a bad giveaway for the old man when he has to travel with a young whale like Ted here. You're right, it is. To Ted, I suppose, you're in college now. Proudly, no, uh, not till next fall. I'm just kind of giving the different colleges the once-over now. As the conductor went on his affable way, huge watch chain jingling against his blue chest, Babbitt and Ted gravely considered colleges. They arrived at Chicago late at night. They lay abed in the morning, rejoicing. Pretty nice not to have to get up and get down to breakfast, eh? They were staying at the modest Eldon Hotel, because Zenith businessmen always stayed at the Aden. But they had dinner in the brocade and crystal Versailles room of the Regency Hotel. Babbitt ordered Blue Point oysters with cocktail sauce, a tremendous steak with a tremendous platter of French fried potatoes, two pots of coffee, apple pie with ice cream for both of them, and for Ted, an extra piece of mince pie. Hot stuff, some feed, young fellow. Ted admired. Huh? You stick around with me, old man, and I'll show you a good time. They went to a musical comedy and nudged each other at the matrimonial jokes and the prohibition jokes. They paraded the lobby, arm in arm, between acts, and in the glee of his first release from the shame which dissevers fathers and sons, Ted chuckled. Dad, did you ever hear the one about the three millionaires and the judge? When Ted had returned to Zenith, Babbitt was lonely. As he was trying to make alliance between Offutt and certain Milwaukee interests which wanted the racetrack plot, most of his time was taken up in waiting for telephone calls, sitting on the edge of his bed, holding the portable telephone, asking wearily, Mr. Sagan, uh, not in yet? Didn't he leave any message for me? All right, I'll hold the wire. Staring at a stain on the wall, reflecting that it resembled a shoe, and being bored by his twentieth discovery that it resembled a shoe. Lighting a cigarette, then bound to the telephone with no ashtray in reach, wondering what to do with this burning menace, and anxiously trying to toss it into the tiled bathroom. At last, on the telephone. No message, eh? All right, I'll call up again. One afternoon he wandered through the snow-rutted streets of which he had never heard, streets of small tenements and two-family houses, and maroon cottages. It came to him that he had nothing to do that was nothing he wanted to do. He was bleakly lonely in the evening. When he dined by himself at the Regency Hotel, he sat in the lobby afterward in a plush chair bedecked with the saxe coburg arms. Lighting a cigar and looking for someone who would come and play with him, and save him from thinking. In the chair next to him, showing the arms of Lithuania, was a half-familiar man, a large red-faced man with pop eyes and a deficient yellow mustache. He seemed kind and insignificant, and as lonely as Babbitt himself. He wore a tweed suit and a reluctant orange tie. He came to Babbitt with a pyrotechnic crash. The melancholy stranger was Sir Gerald Doak. Instinctively, Babbitt rose, bumbling, How are you, Sir Gerald? Remember we met in Zenith at Charlie McKelvey's? Babbitt's my name, real estate. Oh, how do you do? Sir Gerald shook hands flabbily. Embarrassed, standing, wondering how he could retreat, Babbitt meandered. Well, I suppose you've been having a great trip since we saw you in Zenith. Quite. British Columbia and California, and all over the place, he said doubtfully, looking at Babbitt lifelessly. How did you find business conditions in British Columbia? Or I suppose maybe you didn't look into them. Scenery and sport and so on. Scenery? Oh, capital. But business conditions? You know, Mr. Babbitt, they're having almost as much unemployment as we are. Sir Gerald was speaking warmly now. So, business conditions not so doggone good, eh? No, business conditions weren't at all what I had hoped to find them. Not good, eh? No, not. Not really good. That's a darn shame. Well, I suppose you're waiting for somebody to take you out to some big shindig, Sir Gerald. Shindig? Oh, shindig. No, to tell you the truth, I was wondering what the deuce I could do this evening. Don't know a soul in Chicago. Wonder if you happen to know whether there's a good theater in this city. Good? 
Why, say, they're running grand opera tonight. I guess maybe you'd like that? Eh, yeah, yeah, went to the opera once in London. Covenant Garden sort of thing. Shocking. No, I was wondering if there was a good a cinema show. Babbitt was sitting down, hitching his chair over, shouting, Movie! Say, Sir Gerald, I suppose, of course, you had a raft of dames wanting to lead you out to some soiree. God forbid. But if you haven't, what do you say we go to a movie? There's a peach of a film at the Grantham. Bill Hart in a bandit picture. Rato, just a moment while I get my coat. Swollen with greatness, slightly afraid lest the noble blood of Nottingham change its mind and leave him at any street corner, Babbitt paraded with Sir Gerald Doak to the movie palace and in silent bliss sat beside him, trying not to be too enthusiastic, lest the knight despise his adoration of six-shooters and broncos. At the end, Sir Gerald murmured, "'Got a good picture, this. So awful decent of you to take me. Haven't enjoyed myself so much in weeks. All those hostesses, and they never let you go to the cinema.' the devil you say babbitt's speech had lost the delicate refinement and all the broad a's with which he had adorned it and became hearty and natural well i'm tickled to death you liked it sir gerald they crawled past the knees of a fat woman into the aisle they stood in the lobby waving their arms in their right of putting on overcoats babbitt hinted say uh, how about a little something to eat i know a place where we could get a swell rarebit and we might dig up a little drink, that is, if you ever touch this stuff. Rather, but why not? Come to my room. I have some scotch. Not half bad. Oh, I don't want to use up all your hooch. It's darn nice of you, but you probably want to hit the hay. Sir Gerald was transformed. He was beefily yearning. Oh, really, now, I haven't had a decent evening for so long, having to go to all those dances, no chance to discuss business and that sort of thing. Do be a good chap and come along, won't you? Will I? You bet. I just thought maybe, say, by golly, it does do a fellow good, don't it, to sit and visit about business condition after he's been to all these balls and masquerades and banquets and all that society stuff. I often feel that way in Zenith. Sure, you bet I'll come. That's awfully nice of you. They beamed along the street. Look here, old chap. Can you tell me, do American cities always keep up this dreadful social pace? All these magnificent parties? Oh, now, quit your kidding. Gosh, you with court balls and functions and everything? No, nah, really, old chap. Mother and I, Lady Doak, I should say, we usually play a hand of Bessique and go to bed at ten. Bless my soul, I couldn't keep up your beastly pace. And talking. All you American women, they know so much. Culture and that sort of thing. This Mrs. McEvely, your friend? Yeah, oh, Lucille, good kid. She asked me which of the galleries I liked best in Florence. Or was it Firenze? Never been to Italy in my life. And primitives? Did I like primitives? Do you know what the deuce a primitive is? Me? I should say not, but I know what a discount for cash is rather so do i by george but primitives the uh, primitives they laughed with the sound of a booster's luncheon sir gerald's room was except for his ponderous and durable english bags very much like the room of george f babbitt and quite in the manner of babbitt he disclosed a huge whiskey flask looked proud and hospitable and chuckled say when old chap it was after the third drink that Sir Gerald proclaimed, How do you Yankees getting the notion that writing chaps like Bernard Shaw and this Wells represent us? The real business, England. We think these chaps are traitors. Both our countries have their comics, old aristocracy, you know, old country families, hunting people and all that sort of thing. And we both have our wretched labor leaders but we both have a backbone of sound businessmen who run the whole show. You bet. Here's to the real guys. I'm with you. Here's to ourselves. It was after the fourth drink that Sir Gerald asked humbly, What do you think of North Dakota mortgages? 
but it was not till after the fifth drink that Babbitt began to call him Jerry, and Sir Gerald confided, "'I say, do you mind if I pull off my boots?' and ecstatically stretched his nightly feet, his poor, tired, hot, swollen feet, out on the bed. After the sixth, Babbitt irregularly rose. Oh, better get to hiking along, Jerry. You're a regular human being. I wish to thunder we'd been better acquainted in Zenith. Look it. Can't you come back and stay with me for a while? So sorry. Must go to New York tomorrow. Most awfully sorry, old boy. I haven't enjoyed an evening so much since I've been in the States. Real talk. Not all this social rot. I'd never have let them give me the beastly title. And I didn't get it for nothing, eh? If I thought I'd have to talk to women about primitives and polo. Goodly thing to have in Nottingham. Though annoyed the mayor most frightfully when I got it. And, of course, the missus likes it. But nobody calls me Jerry now. He was almost weeping and nobody in the States has treated me like a friend till tonight. Goodbye, old chap. Goodbye. Thanks awfully. No mention it, Jerry, and remember, whenever you get to Zenith, the latch string is always out. And don't forget, old boy, if you ever come to Nottingham, Mother and I will be frightfully glad to see you. I shall tell the fellows in Nottingham your ideas about visions and real guys at our next Rotary Club luncheon. 4. Babbitt lay abed at his hotel, imagining the Zenith Athletic Club asking him, "'What kind of time do you have in Chicago?' in his answering. Oh, fair. Ran around with Sir Gerald Doak a lot. Picturing himself meeting Lucille McEvely and the monisher. "'You're all right, Mrs. Mack. When you aren't trying to pull this highbrow pose, it's just as Gerald Doak says to me in Chicago. Oh, yes, Jerry's an old friend of mine.' The wife and I are thinking of running over to England to stay with Jerry in his castle next year. He said to me, Georgie old bean, I like Lucille first rate, but you and me, Georgie, we got to make her get over this hidey tidy hoop a diddle the way she's got. But that evening a thing happened which wrecked his pride. 5. At the Regency Hotel cigar counter, he fell to talking with a salesman of pianos, and they dined together. Babbitt was filled with friendliness and well-being. He enjoyed the gorgeousness of the dining-room, the chandeliers, the looped brocade curtains, the portraits of French kings, the guest panel of gilded oak. He enjoyed the crowd, pretty women, good solid fellows who were liberal spenders. He gasped, he stared, and turned away, stared again. Three tables off, with a doubtful sort of woman, a woman at once coy and withered, was Paul Risley and Paul was supposed to be an Akron, selling tar roofing. The woman was tapping his hand, mooning at him and giggling. Babbitt felt that he had encountered something involved and harmful. Paul was talking with the rapt earnestness of a man who was telling his troubles. He was concentrated on the woman's faded eyes. Once he held her hand, and once blind to the other guests, he puckered his lips as though he was pretending to kiss her. Babbitt had so strong an impulse to go to Paul, that he could feel his body uncoiling, his shoulders moving. But he felt desperately that he must be diplomatic, and not till he saw Paul paying the check did he bluster to the piano salesman. By a golly, friend of mine over there. Excuse me a second. Just say hello to him. He touched Paul's shoulder and cried, well, When did you hit town? Paul glared up at him, face hardening. Oh, hello, George. Thought you'd gone back to Zenith. He didn't introduce his companion. Babbitt peeped at her. She was a flabbily pretty, weakly, flirtatious woman of forty-two or three, in an atrocious flowery hat. Her rouging was thorough, but unskillful. "'Where are you staying, Paulibus?' The woman turned, yawned, examined her nails. She seemed accustomed to not being introduced. Paul grumbled. "'Campbell in on the south side.' "'Alone?' It sounded insinuating. Yes, unfortunately. Furiously, Paul turned toward the woman, smiling with a fondness sickening to Babbitt. May, I want to introduce you. Mrs. Arnold, this is my old acquaintance, George Babbitt. Where to meet you? growled Babbitt, while she gurgled. Oh, I'm pleased to meet you, any friend of Mr. Risling's, I'm sure. Babbitt demanded. Be back there later this evening, Paul. I'll drop down and see you. No better. We better lunch 
together tomorrow. All right, but I'll see you tonight, too, Paul. I'll go down to your hotel and I'll wait for you. End of chapter 19 Babbitt by Sinclair Lewis Chapter 20 1. He sat smoking with a piano salesman, clinging to the warm refuge of gossip, afraid to venture into the thoughts of Paul. He was the more affable on the surface as secretly he became more apprehensive, felt more hollow. He was certain that Paul was in Chicago without Zilia's knowledge, and that he was doing things not at all moral and secure. When the salesman yawned that he had to write up his orders, Babbitt left him, left the hotel in leisurely calm, but savagely he said, "'Gamble in,' to the taxi driver." He sat agitated on the slippery leather seat, in that chill dimness which smelled of dust and perfume and Turkish cigarettes. He did not heed the snowy lakefront, the dark spaces and sudden bright corners in the unknown land south of the loop. The office of the Campbell Inn was hard, bright, new, the night clerk harder and brighter. Yep, he said to Babbitt. Mr. Uh, Paul Riesling registered here. Yep. Is he here now? Nope. Then, if you'll give me his key, I'll wait for him. Can't do that, brother. Wait down here if you want to. Babbitt had spoken with a deference which all the clan of good fellows give to hotel clerks. Now he said with snarling abruptness, I may have to wait some time. I'm Risling's brother-in-law. I'll go up to his room. Do I look like a sneak thief? His voice was low and not pleasant. With considerable haste, the clerk took down the key, protesting, "'Never said you looked like a sneak thief. Just rules to the hotel, but if you want to.' On his way up in the elevator, Babbitt wondered why he was here. Why shouldn't Paul be dining with a respectable married woman? Why had he lied to the clerk about being Paul's brother-in-law? He had acted like a child. He must be careful not to say foolish, dramatic things to Paul. As he settled down, he tried to look pompous and placid. And he thought, suicide. He'd been dreading that without knowing it. Paul would be just the person to do something like that. He must be out of his head, or he wouldn't be confiding in that. The dried up old hag. Zilla, oh, damn Zilla now. How gladly he'd throttle that nagging fiend of a woman. She'd probably succeed at last and driven Paul crazy. Suicide out there on the lake, way out, beyond the piled ice along the shore. It'd be ghastly cold to drop into the water tonight. Or throat cut in the bathroom. Babbitt flung into Paul's bathroom. It was empty. He smiled feebly. He pulled at his choking collar, looked at his watch, opened the window to stare down the street, looked at his watch, tried to read the evening paper laying on the glass-top bureau, looked again at his watch. Three minutes had gone by since he had first looked at it, and he waited for three hours. He was sitting fixed, chilled, when the doorknob turned. Paul came in, glowering. Hello, Paul said. Been waiting? Well, a little while. Well? Well, what? Just thought I'd drop in to see how you made out in Akron. Did all right. What difference does it make? My gosh, Paul, what are you sore about? What are you butting into my affairs for? Well, Paul, that, that's no way to talk. I'm not butting into nothing. I was so glad to see your ugly old fizz that I just dropped by in to say howdy. Well, I'm not going to have anybody following me around and trying to boss me. I've had all of that I'm going to stand. Oh, gosh, I'm not. I didn't like the way you looked at May Arnold or the snooty way you talked. Well, all right, then. If you think I'm a Boninsky, then I'll just butt in. I don't know who your May Arnold is, but I know doggone good and well that you and her weren't talking about tar roofing, no, nor about playing the violin, neither. If you haven't got any moral consideration for yourself, you ought to have some for your position in the community. The idea of you going around places guapping in a female's eyes like a lovesick pup. I can understand how a fellow slipping once, but... 
I don't propose to see a fellow that's been as chummy with me as you have, getting started on the downward path and sneaking off from his wife, even as cranky as one of Zelia, to go woman-chasing. Oh, you're a perfectly moral little husband. And by God, I never looked at a woman except Myra since I've been married, practically, and I never will. I'll tell you there's nothing to immortality. Don't pay. Can't you see, old man? It just makes Zilia still crankier. Slide of resolution as he was of body, Paul threw his snow-beaded overcoat on the floor and crouched on a flimsy cane chair. Oh, you're an old blowhard, and you know less about morality than Tinka. But you're all right, Georgie. But you can't understand that I'm through. I, I can't go Zilia's hammering any longer. She's made up her mind that I'm a devil. Regular inquisition torture. She enjoys it. It's a game to see how sore she can make me and me. Either it's find a little comfort, any comfort, anywhere, or else do something a lot worse. Now this Miss Arnold, she's not so young, but she's a fine woman, and she understands a fella, and she's had her own troubles. Yeah, I suppose she's one of those hens whose husband doesn't understand her. I don't know, maybe. He was killed in the war. Babbitt lumbered up, stood beside Paul, patting his shoulder, making soft, apologetic noises. Honest, George. She's a fine woman, and she's had one hell of a time. We manage to jolly each other a lot. We tell each other we're the dandiest pair on earth. Maybe we don't believe it, but it helps a lot to have somebody with whom you can be perfectly simple. And not all this discussing, explaining. And that's as far as you go. It is not gone. Say it. Well, I don't. I, I can't say. I like it, but with a burst which left him feeling large and shining with generosity. It's none of my darn business. I'll do anything I can for you, if there's anything I can do. It might be, I judge from Zelia's letters that I've been forwarded from Macron, that she's getting suspicious about my staying away so long. She'd be perfectly capable of having me shadowed, and of coming to Chicago and bursting into a hotel dining room and bawling me out before everybody. I'll take care of Zelia. I'll hand her a good fairy story when I get back to Zenith. I don't know. I don't think you'd better try it. You're a good fellow. But I don't know that diplomacy is your strong point. Babbitt looked hurt, then irritated. I mean with women. With women, I mean. Of course, they got to go some to beat you in business diplomacy. But I just mean with women. Zelia may do a lot of rough talking, but she's pretty shrewd. She'd have the story out of you in no time. Well, all right, but Babbitt was still pathetic at not being allowed to play secret agent. Paul soothed. Of course, maybe you might tell her you'd been in Akron and seen me there. Well, sure, you bet. Don't I have to look at uh, candy store property in Akron? Didn't I? Ain't it a shame I have to stop off there when I'm so anxious to get home? Ain't it a regular shame? I'll say it is. I'll say it's a doggone shame. Fine, but for glory hallelujah's sake, don't go putting any fancy fixings on the story. When men lie, they always try to make it too artistic. And that's why women get suspicious, and... Let's have a drink, Georgie. I've got some gin and a little vermouth. The Paul, who normally refused a second cocktail, took a second now and a third. He became red-eyed and thick-tongued. He was embarrassingly jocular and salacious. In the taxicab, Babbitt incredulously found tears crowding into his eyes. 2. He had not told Paul of his plan, but he did stop at Akron, between trains, for the one purpose of sending a postcard to Zilla. With, had to come here for the day, ran into Paul. In Zenith, he called on her. If for public appearances, Zilla was overquaffed, overpainted, and resolutely corseted, for private misery, she wore a filthy blue dressing-gown and torn stockings, thrust into streaky pink satin mules. Her face was sunken. She seemed to have but half as much hair as Bybit remembered, and that half was stringy. She sat in a rocker amid a debris of candy boxes and cheap magazines, and she sounded dolorous when she did not sound derisive. But Babbitt was exceedingly breezy. "'Well, well, Zill, old dear,' Having a good loaf while hubby's away? That's the ideal, I'll bet a hat. Myra never got up till ten while I was in Chicago. Say, could I borrow your thermos? Just dropped in to see if I could borrow your thermos bottle. 
we're going to have a toboggan party. Want to take some coffee, Mitt? Oh, did you get my card from Akron saying I'd run into Paul? Yes. What was he doing? How do you mean? He unbuttoned his overcoat, sat tentatively on the arm of a chair. You know what I mean. She slapped the pages of a magazine with an irritable clatter. I suppose he was trying to make love to some hotel waitress or manicure girl or somebody. Hang it, you're always letting on that Paul goes around chasing skirts. He doesn't, in the first place. And if he did, it would probably be because you keep hinting at him and dinging at him so much. I hadn't meant to, Zilla, but since Paul is away in Akron... He really is in Akron. I know he has some horrible woman that he writes to in Chicago. Didn't I tell you I saw him in Akron? What are you trying to do, make me out a liar? No, but I just... I get so worried. Now there you are. That's what gets me. Here you love Paul, and you plague him and cuss him out as if you hated him. I simply can't understand why it is that the more some folks love people, the harder they try to make them miserable. You love Ted and Roan, I suppose, and you nag them. Oh, well, that, that's different. Besides, I don't nag them. Not what you'd call nagging, but... As I sing, now here's Paul, the nicest, most sensitive critter on God's green earth. You ought to be ashamed of yourself the way you pan him. Why, you talk to him like a washerwoman. I'm surprised you can act so doggone common, Zilla. She brooded over her linked fingers. Oh, I know I do go and get mean sometimes, and I'm sorry afterwards, but, oh, Georgie, Paul is so aggravating. Honestly. I've tried awfully hard these last few years to be nice to him, but just because I used to be spiteful, or I seemed so, I wasn't really, but I used to speak up and say anything that came into my head, and so he made up his mind that everything was my fault. Everything can't always be my fault, can it? And now if I get to fussing, he just turns silent, oh, so dreadfully silent, and he won't look at me. He just ignores me. He simply isn't human and he deliberately keeps it up till I bust out and say a lot of things I don't mean. So silent. Oh, you righteous men, how wicked you are, how rotten wicked. They thrashed things over and over for half an hour. At the end, weeping, terribly, Zilla promised to restrain herself. Paul returned four days later, and the Babbitts and Raislings went festively to the movies and had chop suey at a Chinese restaurant. As they walked to the restaurant, through a street of tailor shops and barber shops, the two wives in front, chattering about cooks, Babbitt murmured to Paul, "'Girl seems a lot nicer now.' "'Yes, she has been, except once or twice, but it's too late now. I just—I'm not going to discuss it, but I'm afraid of her. There's nothing left. I don't ever want to see her. Some day I'm going to break away from her. Somehow.'" End of chapter 20 Babbitt by Sinclair Lewis Chapter 21 The International Organization of Boosters Clubs has become a world force for optimism, mainly pleasantry, and good business. Chapters are to be found now in 30 countries. 920 of the thousand chapters, however, are in the United States. None of these is more ardent than the Zenith Boosters Club. The second March launch of the Zenith Boosters was the most important of the year, as it was to be followed by the annual election of officers. There was agitation abroad. The lunch was held in the ballroom of the O'Hearn House. As each of the four hundred boosters entered, he took, from a wallboard, a huge celluloid button announcing his name, his nickname, and his business. There was a fine of ten cents for calling a fellow booster by anything but his nickname at a lunch, and as Babbitt joyfully checked his hat, the air was radiant with shouts of, "Hello, Chet!" and "Hello, you, Shorty!" and "Top of the morning, Mac!" They sat at friendly tables for eight, choosing places by lot. Babbitt was with Abbott Booz, the merchant tailor, Hector Sabolt of the Little Sweetheart Condensed Milk Company, Emil Wingret, the jeweler Professor Pomproy of the Right Way Business College, Doctor Walter Gorbett, Roy Teagarden, the photographer and Ben Berkeley, the photo-engraver. 
One of the merits of the Booster Club was that only two persons from each department of business were permitted to join, so that you at once encountered the ideals of other occupations and realized the metaphysical oneness of all occupations, plumbing and portrait painting, medicine and the manufacture of chewing gum. Babbitt's table was particularly happy today because Professor Pomeroy had just had a birthday and was therefore open to teasing. Let's pump pump about how old he is, said Emil Wingert. No, let's paddle him with a dancing pump, said Ben Berkeley. But it was Babbitt who had the applause with, Don't talk about pumps to that guy. The only pump he knows is a bottle. Honest, they tell me he's starting a class in home brewing at the old college. At each place was the Booster Club booklet listing the members. Though the object of the club was good fellowship, yet they never lost sight of the importance of doing a little more business. After each name was the member's occupation. There were scores of advertisements in the booklet, and on one page the abdomination, There's no rule that you have to trade with your fellow boosters, but get wise, boy. What's the use of letting this good money go outside our happy family? And at each place today there was a present, a card printed, in artistic red and black. Service and Boosterism Service finds its finest opportunity and development only in its broadest and deepest application, and the consideration of its perpetual action upon reaction. I believe the highest type of service, like the most progressive tenets of ethics, senses unceasingly and is motivated by active adherence and loyalty to that which is the essential principle of boosterism, good citizenship, in all its factors and aspects. Dad Peterson Compliments of Dadbury Peterson Advertising Corporation Ads, not fads, at dads. The boosters all read Mr. Peterson's aphorism and said they understood it perfectly. The meeting opened with the regular weekly stunts. Retiring President Virgil Gunch was in his chair, his stiff hair like a hedge, his voice like a brazen gong of festival. Members who had brought guests introduced them publicly. This tall, redheaded piece of misinformation is the sporting editor of the press, said Willis Jemmes, and H. H. Hazen, the druggist, chanted, Boys, when you're on a long motor tour and finally get to a romantic spot or scene and draw up and remark to the wife, this is certainly a romantic place. It sends a glow right up and down your vertebrae. Well, my guest today is from such a place, Harper's Ferry, Virginia, in the beautiful Southland, with memories of good old General Robert E. Lee and that brave soul, John Brown, who, like every good booster, goes marching on. There were two especially distinguished guests, the leading man of the Bird of Paradise, company playing his week at the Dodsworth Theater, and the mayor of Zenith, the Honorable Lucas Prout. Virgil Gutz thundered, When we managed to grab this celebrated thespian off his lovely aggregation of beautiful actresses, and I got to admit, I butted right into his dressing room and told him how the boosters appreciated the high-class artistic performance he's giving us, and don't forget that the treasurer of the Dodsworth is a booster and will appreciate our patronage. And when on top of that we yank his honor out of the Malfucius duties at City Hall, then I feel we've done ourselves proud. And Mr. Prout will now say a few words about the problems and duties. By rising vote, the booster decided which was the handsomest and which the ugliest guest and to each of them was given a bunch of carnations, donated, President Gulch noted, by Brother Booster H. G. Yeager, the Jennifer Avenue florist. Each week, in rotation, four boosters were privileged to obtain the pleasures of generosity and publicity by donating goods or services to four fellow members, chosen by lot. There was laughter this week when one of the contributors was announced as Barnabas Joy, the undertaker. Everybody whispered, I can think of a couple of good guys to be buried if his donation is a free funeral. Through all these diversions, the boosters were lunching on chicken croquettes, peas, fried potatoes, coffee, apple pie, and American cheese. Gunch did not lump the speeches. Presently, he called on the visiting secretary of the Zenith Rotary Club, a rival organization, 
the secretary had the distinction of possessing state motor car license number five the rotary secretary laughingly admitted that wherever he drove in the state so low a number created a sensation and though it was pretty nice to have the honor yet traffic cops remembered it only too darn well and sometimes he didn't know but what he'd almost as soon have just plain b five six eight seven six or something like that only let any doggone booster try to get number five away from a live rotarian next year and watch the fur fly and if they'd permit him he'd wind up calling for a cheer for the boosters and rotarians and the kiwanis all together babbitt sighed to professor pumphrey be pretty nice to have a low number as that everybody'd say he must be an important guy wonder how he got it i'll bet he whined and dined the superintendent of motor license bureau to fare you well then chum frink addressed them some of you may feel that it's out of place here to talk on a strictly highbrow and artistic subject but i want to come out flat-footed and ask you boys to o k the proposition of a symphony orchestra for zenith now where a lot of you make your mistake is assuming that if you don't like classical music and all that junk you ought to oppose it now i want to confess that though i'm a literary guy by profession i don't care a rap for all this long-haired music i'd rather listen to a good jazz band at any time to some piece by beethoven that hasn't any more tune to it than a bunch of fighting cats and you couldn't whistle it to save your life but that isn't the point culture has become as necessary an adornment and advertisement for a city today as pavements or bank clearances it's culture in theaters and art galleries and so on that brings thousands of visitors to new york every year and to be frank for all our splendid attainments we haven't yet got the culture of a new york or chicago or boston or at least we don't get the credit for it the thing to do then as a live bunch of go-getters is to capitalize culture to go right out and grab it pictures and books are fine for those that have the time to study em but they don't shoot out on the road and holler this is what little old zenith can put up in the way of culture that's precisely what a symphony orchestra does look at the credit minneapolis and cincinnati get an orchestra with first class musicers and a swell conductor and i believe we ought to do the thing up brown and get one of the highest paid conductors on the market providing he ain't a hun it goes right into beantown and new york and washington it plays at the best theaters to the most cultured and moneyed people it gives such class advertising as a town can get in no other way and the guy who is so short-sighted as to crib his orchestra a proposition is passing up the chance to impress the glorious name of zenith on some big new york millionaire that might that might establish a branch factory here i could also go into the fact that for our daughters who show an interest in highbrow music and may want to teach it having an a one local organization is of great benefit but let's keep this on a practical basis and i call on you good brothers to whoop it up for culture and a world-beating symphony orchestra they applauded to a rustle of excitement president gunch proclaimed gentlemen we will now proceed to the annual election of officers for each of the six offices three candidates had been chosen by a committee the second name among the candidates for vice president was babbitts he was surprised he looked self-conscious his heart pounded he was still more agitated than when the ballots were counted and gunch said it's a pleasure to announce that georgie babbitt will be the inest assistant gavel wielder i know of no man who stands more staunchly for common sense and enterprise than good old george come on let's give him our best long yell as they adjourned a hundred men crushed in to slap his back he had never known a higher moment he drove away in a blur of wonder he lunged into his office chuckling to miss mcgowan well i guess you better congratulate your boss been elected vice president of the boosters he was disappointed she answered only yes yeah, so oh mrs babbitt been trying to get you on the phone but the new salesman fritz weingert said by golly chief say that's great that's perfectly great i'm tickled to death congratulations 
Babbitt called the house and crowed to his wife. Heard you're trying to get me, Myra. Say, you got to hand it to little Georgie this time. Better talk careful. You are now addressing the vice president of the Boosters Club. Oh, Georgie. Pretty nice, huh? Willis Ijams is the new president, but when he's away, little old Georgie takes a gavel and whoops some up and introduces the speakers, no matter if they're the governor himself and... George, listen. It puts him in solid with big men like Doc Dilling and George Paul Riesling. Yeah, sure. I'll phone Paul and let him know about it right away. Georgie, listen. Paul's in jail. He shot his wife. He shot Celia this noon. She may not live. End of chapter 21 Babbitt by Sinclair Lewis Chapter 22 one. He drove to the city prison not blindly, but with unusually fussy care at corners, the fussiness of an old woman potting plants. It kept him from facing the obscenity of fate. The attendant said, No, you can't see any of the prisoners till three thirty, visiting hour. It was three. For half an hour, Babbitt sat looking at a calendar and a clock on the whitewashed wall. The chair was hard and mean and creaky. People went through the office, and he thought stared at him. He felt a belligerent defiance, which broke into a wincing fear of this machine which was grinding Paul. Paul. Exactly at half-past three he sent in his name. The attendant returned with, Riesling says he don't want to see you. You're crazy. You didn't give him my name. Tell him it's George wants to see him. George Babbitt. Yeah, I told him. All right, all right. He said he didn't want to see you. Then take me in anyway. Nothing doing. If you ain't his lawyer, if he don't want to see you, that's all there is to it. But my God! Say, let me see the warden. He's busy. Come on, now, you— Babbitt reared over him. The attendants hastily changed to a coaxing, You can come back and try tomorrow. Probably the poor guy is off his nut. Babbitt drove, not at all carefully or fussily, sliding viciously past trucks, ignoring the truckers' curses, to the city hall. He stopped with a grind of wheels against the curb, and ran up the marble steps to the office of the Honorable Mr. Lucas Prout, the mayor. He bribed the mayor's doorman with a dollar. He was instantly inside, demanding, "'You remember me, Mr. Prout, Babbitt, vice president of the Boosters? Campaign for you.' Say, uh, have you heard about poor Riesling? Well, I want an order on the warden, or whatever you call him, of the city prison, to take me back and see him. Good, thanks. In fifteen minutes he was pounding down the prison corridor to a cage where Paul Riesling sat on a cot, twisted like an old beggar, his legs crossed, arms in a knot, fighting at his clenched fist. Paul looked up blankly as the keeper unlocked the cell, admitted Babbitt, and left them together. He spoke slowly. Go on, be moral. Babbitt plumped on the couch beside him. I'm not going to be moral. I don't care what happened. I just want to do anything I can. I'm glad Zilia got what was coming to her. Paul said argumentatively, Now, don't go jumping on Zilla. I've been thinking about maybe she hadn't had any too easy a time. Just after I shot her, I didn't hardly mean to, but she got to deviling me so I went crazy just for a second and pulled out that old revolver you and I used to shoot rabbits with and took a crack at her. Didn't hardly mean to. After that, when I was trying to stop the blood, it was terrible what I did to her shoulder. And she had beautiful skin. Maybe she won't die. I hope it won't leave her skin all scarred. But just afterward, when I was hunting through the bathroom for some cotton to stop the blood, I ran onto the fuzzy little yellow duck we hung on the tree one Christmas, and I remembered she and I had been awfully happy then. Hell, I can't hardly believe it's me here. As Babbitt's arm tightened about his shoulder, Paul sighed, I'm glad you came, but I thought maybe you'd lecture me, and when you've committed a murder, and been brought here, and everything, there was a big crowd outside the apartment house, all staring, and the cops took me through it. Well, I'm not going to talk about it any more. But he went on in a monotonous, terrified, insane mumble. To divert him, Babbitt said, Well, you got a scar on your cheek. 
Yes, that's where the cop hit me. I suppose cops get a lot of fun out of lecturing murderers, too. He was a big fellow, and they wouldn't let me help carry Zilla down to the ambulance. Paul, quit it. Listen, she won't die, and when it's all over, you and I'll go off to Maine again, and maybe we can get that May Arnold to go along. I'll go up to Chicago and ask her. Good woman, by golly, and afterwards... I'll see that you get started in business out west somewhere, maybe Seattle. They say it's a lovely city. Paul was half smiling. It was Babbitt who rambled now. He could not tell whether Paul was heeding, but he droned on till the coming of Paul's lawyer, P.J. Maxwell, a thin, busy, unfriendly man who nodded at Babbitt and hinted, If Reisling and I could uh, be alone for a moment. Babbitt wrung Paul's hands and waited in the office till Maxwell came pattering out. "'Look, old man, what can I do?' he begged. "'Nothing, not a thing.' "'Not just now,' said Maxwell. "'Sorry. Got to hurry. And don't try to see him. I've had the doctor give him a shot of morphine so he'll sleep.' It seemed somehow wicked to return to the office. Babbitt felt as though he had just come from a funeral. He drifted out to the city hospital to inquire about Zilla. She was not likely to die, he learned. The bullet from Paul's old forty-four army revolver had smashed her shoulder and torn upward and out. He wandered home and found his wife radiant with the horrified interest we have in the tragedies of our friends. Of course, Paul isn't altogether to blame, but it, this is what comes of his chasing after another woman instead of bearing his cross in a Christian way, she exulted. He was too languid to respond as he desired. He said what was to be said about the Christian bearing of crosses and went out to clean the car. Dully, patiently, he scrapped linty grease from the drip pan, gouged at the mud cake on the wheels. He used up many minutes in washing his hands, scoured them with gritty kitchen soap, rejoiced in hurting his plump knuckles. Damn soft hands like a woman, ah! At dinner, when his wife began the inevitable, he bellowed, "'I forbid any of you to say a word about Paul. I'll tend to all the talking about this that's necessary. Hear me? There's going to be one house in this scandal-mongering town tonight that isn't going to spring the holier-than-thou and throw those filthy evening papers out of the house.' But he himself read the papers after dinner. Before nine, he set out for the house of Lawyer Maxwell. He was received without cordiality. Well, said Maxwell, I want to offer my services in the trial. I've got an idea. Why couldn't I go on the stand and swear I was there, and she pulled a gun first, and he wrestled with her, and the gun went off accidentally? And perjure yourself. Huh? Yes, I suppose it would be perjury. Oh, wouldn't it help? But, my dear fellow, perjury. Oh, don't be a fool. Excuse me, Maxwell. I didn't mean to get your goat. I just mean I've known and you've known many and many a case of perjury just to annex some rotten little piece of real estate. And here, where it's a case of saving Paul from going to prison, I'd perjure myself black in the face. No, aside from the ethics of the matter, I'm afraid it isn't practicable. The prosecutor would tear your testimony to pieces. It's known that only Reisling and his wife were there at the time. And look here. Let me go on the stand and swear, and this would be the God's truth, that she pestered him till he kind of went crazy. No, sorry, Reisling absolutely refuses to have any testimony reflecting on his wife. He insists on pleading guilty. Then let me go up and testify something. Whatever you say, I, let me do something. I'm sorry, Babbitt. But the best thing you can do, I hate to say it, but you could help us most by keeping strictly out of it. Babbitt, revolving his hat like a defending poor tenant, winched so visibly that Maxwell condescended. I don't like to hurt your feelings, but you see, we both want to do our best for Risling, and we mustn't consider any other factor. The trouble with you, Babbitt, is that you're one of those fellows who talk too readily. You like to hear your own voice. If there were anything for which I could put you in the witness box, you'd get going and give the whole show away. Sorry. Now I must look over some papers. So sorry. 2. He spent most of the next morning nerving himself to face the garrulous world of the athletic club. They would talk about Paul. They would be lip-licking and rotten. 
But at the rough next table they did not mention Paul. They spoke with zeal of the coming baseball season. He loved them as he never had before. Three. He had, doubtless from some storybook, pictured Paul's trial as a long struggle, with bitter arguments, a taut crowd, and sudden and overwhelming new testimony. Actually, the trial occupied less than fifteen minutes, largely filled with the evidence of doctors that Zilla would recover and that Paul must have been temporarily insane. Next day Paul was sentenced to three years in the state penitentiary and taken off, quite undramatically, not handcuffed, merely plodding in a tired way beside a cheerful deputy sheriff. And after saying good-bye to him at the station, Babbitt returned to his office, to realize that he faced a world which, without Paul, was meaningless. End of chapter 22